I want to start just by reading a couple of verses just to just to invest in our lives some things that are scriptural things that are positive things. And I'm reading just one verse from Joshua, Joshua 1.8. And Joshua 1.8 says that this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. You can't be a Christian. You can't try to live for God without that. And so that's wherever you are today in your walk with God, wherever you are today as a Christian, you have to understand that if I am going to be changed, if I am going to be transformed, it isn't going to be from the things I see as I live in this world. This is going to be from the things I hear as I live in this world. It's only going to be as I open up the book and I read it and I meditate on it. It's interesting. It says, the book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. I think that's interesting. It, says, it doesn't say out of your ears or out of your heart. It says out of your mouth. It's in our mouth because it's our mouth that we engage to become active with God. Have you ever notice that? If I were to say to you, I want you to call it to God today, you wouldn't go... <coughs> Right? You'd engage your mouth, you'd say, God, I need you. And the idea was that, as it says in Ephesians, that we're supposed to be singing to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, edifying ourselves. We need to get into God's Word. We need to begin to believe God's Word. We need to meditate on God's Word. If you're going to trust your carnal mind, I can tell you, you're going to have all kinds of weird ideas. To the truth. Right? Barry McGuire, who was a singer... I think it was Barry McGuire that said that he was a singer and he was being interviewed one time and he talked about how Barry McGuire had been this famous singer and now he jumped on the Jesus bandwagon. And he said, well, it's the only bandwagon that's going somewhere. You get on. You know, there's all kinds of things this world promises us, but the realities are, unless we're really going to get on, either get off the bandwagon for God and get on the world's bandwagon, or get off the world's bandwagon and get on God's bandwagon. Choose today what you're going to do. Otherwise, your life is going to be miserable. I'd rather see you make a decision to get on with your life than be torn. And so, let's get on the God bandwagon and say, you know what, with all that I am and all that I have, this is the direction I've chosen to go. I'm with you, God. Give me the strength to see it through. 1 John chapter 1. Today we're going to be talking about the importance of a testimony. It's up. So, sometimes it's funny when you ask for a testimony and someone gets up and they say, uh, I want to share my testimony. I remember when I was a kid, my parents would take me to church and we'd be in the church and they'd say, I think it was because the pastor didn't have a sermon ready. Really, I don't think that. <laughs> and they had what was called testimony night. And I think it's just he got stumped. He just didn't really have anything. The well had run dry. And so it was testimony night. And the only reason I say that is because it was never very edifying. So I don't think it was because he was trying to be have some great thing happen in God. It was just... Um, and, and always there would be some guy that would get up and he'd say, I became a Christian 67 years ago. And I'm thinking, man, that's an old testimony. All right? I hope you have something you're sharing with your neighbor. I hope you have a more current testimony than that. In 1 John 1, starting at verse 1, it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. That you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy might be full. You see, the purpose for a testimony is that it is something that is real and it is alive and it's something that everybody wants. Did you know most commercials or a lot of commercials on television are basically, they call them testimonials. Did you ever notice that? Another word for commercial is testimonial. They'll say at the bottom, this is an actor who was compensated for this testimonial. Yeah. And what it is, is it's Selling to you the product. And our testimonial is what is going to sell the message of Jesus to people. If you're looking across the garden fence at your neighbor and you're going, Oh, i got to go to church tomorrow. Oh, I guess I better do it. God will be happy if I go. 
He's right there with me. He's like, hey, can I come? He's going, oh, it's, it's got, it's got, I want to go. It's got to be great, man. It's got to be great. But if your testimony is one that is alive, it doesn't have to be a big preaching thing. It's just, you know what? The greatest thing happened to me the other day. And he says, what? And he said, you know what? I, I woke up and, and, I, and I couldn't move. And he said, well, what would you do? He said, oh, I just called up to God. I just called up to God in Jesus' name. I said, God, in Jesus' name, just heal my body. Or you know what? I, we were in danger of losing the house. The bill collectors were coming. They were already getting ready to seize it, you know? And we didn't know what we were going to do. But you know, the people at our church gathered with us and we prayed. And God has done a miracle. See, he's looking for something to believe in. You know, we, we talk about religion. And every group of people has a religion. And they walk around with their pamphlets and their dead words. And they go, oh, can, I, can I come to your door and tell you what God would do if he was in control? You know, and you go, no, I'm, I don't want to hear it, thanks. So I, I got to go. <laughs> you know, every group has a, that kind of belief system. But that's not what people are looking for. People aren't looking for dead words on a page. People are looking for something that's real and alive. People, I don't care if there's a God, if He doesn't ever connect with my life. It doesn't do me any good. I don't care if, there's, if I've got to go through all these contortions and then maybe someday in eternity I'll have something. I need something now. I need a God to be involved with me now. I've got problems. I've got issues. I've got things I can't work out. I, I have no hope. I, I'm, I'm dying of cancer or my marriage is breaking up or whatever it is. I need some revelation, some truth, some hope. Let's look and see what the Bible has to say. Luke chapter 7. In Luke chapter 7, John the Baptist, as you know in the story, had pronounced the coming of Jesus. And there came a point in John the Baptist's time in his ministry that he said to his disciples, go and, go and see if Jesus is really the God. In Luke chapter 7, verse 22, Jesus' response to that was, Luke 7, verse 22. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way and tell John which things you have seen and heard. See, the testimony is about what we've seen and heard. How that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor to the poor the gospel is preached. That's the testimony. In Mark 5, we've been in Mark for a few times talking about the Gadarean. And, and I'm, I'm always intrigued with the story of the Gadarean, so we're going to bring him into this discussion as well. In Mark 5, we're starting at verse 15. We're not going to go through the part where the Gadarean gets set free. We, we talked about that last week and a couple of weeks ago where the Gadarean, as you know, he had a legion of demons in him, and Jesus cast the demons out, and they go into the, the herd of pigs, the, the swine. And it says, though, in verse 15, it says, And they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion, sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They were afraid because here was the guy that had run around ripping his clothes off. Here was the guy that had run through the tombs cutting himself. Here's the guy that they tried to, to lock up and chain up, and he broke the chains and they couldn't stop him, and he was just a blight on their whole community. Talk about wanting to lock the doors at night. And all of a sudden, this Jesus comes to town, and he has this interaction with this Gadarene demoniac, and the next time they see him, it says, and there he was. He was sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil, and also concerning the swine, and they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. He said, Jesus, can I come with you? Jesus, can I come with you? Thank you for setting me free. Can I come with you? And here's what Jesus said. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. Now, what did he do? It says in the next verse, And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis, how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. You see, people, we, we got to understand that we have missed a great opportunity in our life. 
The day we were born again, someone said to us, you need to come to church and sit down and be told what to do and listen to. And we missed the best opportunity we had, which was as soon as you become a Christian or as soon as you're set free, go and tell everybody. And watch what happens. I want that, I want that, I want that, I want God to move through my life. But what we do is we bring them here and we sit them down and we talk it all out of them. Well, let me tell you why that will work, brother. Let me, let me tell you here what you need to know before you can go. Let me instill in you the four carnal spiritual laws. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it was a Freudian step on the laws. <laughs> and it's not about the law. Not that we don't study. Yes, because what, you know what happens when you get hungry for God? You seek after Him passionately. When you have all of a sudden 15 of your friends that want to know more about God, what happens to you? You become a sponge for the gospel. You come to this meeting and you sit there and you soak in everything. And you go home and you open the Bible and you go, God, show me, show me what I need to tell my friends. They have questions, they have needs, I need to know. And you begin to have that time in prayer with God that is amazing. In John chapter 4, we have this story. In John chapter 4, the story we're looking at is the tail end of the story of the woman at the well. Now, if we know the story of the woman, if you don't know the stories, I'll be glad to share more with you. We don't have time to go through the whole thing, but John 4, 23, Jesus is talking to her, and they're talking about worship, and they're talking about the things of God, and in verse 23, it starts with this, and Jesus said, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. And God is a spirit that they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And the woman said unto Him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, and when He is come, He will tell us all things. And Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee, and He. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seeketh thou, or why talkest thou with her? And the woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city, and saith to the man, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Right away, an evangelist is born. Gotta come and see this guy. I was there, and I was filling up my pot with water, and he began to tell me all the things about my life. He, he knew that I had been married so many times and the man I was living with wasn't my husband. He knew all about the struggles I had with my religious upbringing and belief system. And he spoke into my life things of hope and power. And in verse 30 it says, And then they went out of the city and came unto him. And in the meanwhile his disciples prayed and saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one another, Hath any man brought him ought to eat? And Jesus saith unto them, and you need to remember this verse, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. When you're thinking about meat in scripture, that's what meat is, is to do the will of him who sent us. Say not ye there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon you bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and you are entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all that I ever did. And so when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word, and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Son of the world. Now I want you to think about it for a moment. In both the story of the Gadarean and the story of the woman at the well, the people that God used were people that nobody would use. Do you feel like you're a person that nobody would use? Fantastic. You're just a prime candidate. The second thing was that through that one encounter with the Gadarean, it says that he went to, through Decapolis telling everybody the story of what had happened to him. Right? Before he ran through there scaring them all because he was ripping his clothes off and cutting himself. Now he was probably scaring them all because he was saying, you got to meet this guy Jesus. Man, it's amazing. I was full of demons and now I'm free. And I can tell you, if you're a person that is either religious or 
an atheist, you don't want to hear that message. You don't want to hear about this guy coming to your door telling you about getting set free. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Right? And here's the woman at the well, an outcast in her society. You know, when I went to India, I was talking about how we went to the village and we went out into the uh, well in the center of the village and the women had the pots on their head to gather water. But nobody went out in the middle of the day. The woman went out in the middle of the day because she wasn't allowed to hang around with all the other people because she was a sinner. They were all in their homes in that time of day. Only Jesus and her were at the well. But it was her that went back to the village and she said to everybody, Come and meet a man that is the Messiah. He told me all the things that I ever did. And it says that many of the people in her village believed because of her testimony. And they came, and even many more heard from Jesus himself. Acts chapter 3. Are you catching a passion for God to do great things? Yes. Amen. Are you catching a passion that, you know, it's not about how many years you spent in some Bible study class? Not that we shouldn't do Bible study. We do it. But let's not wait for the Bible study to go. Let's go and, and continue to study as we're going. Acts chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Here we go. This is the guy, that, you know the guy that sells you pencils, the guy that sat at the gate there, the guy that nobody talked to and everybody tried to stay away from because he wanted money from them all the time. You know the guy. That was his only source of livelihood. He had to find some way to feed himself. He couldn't work. He couldn't do anything. He had been that way since the day he was born. He probably didn't smell great because he probably didn't have good hygiene because he probably couldn't take care of himself real well. He probably didn't have good hygiene because he probably didn't have a very nice place to live. He probably lived in some rat-infested hole. But Peter and John were coming by on their way to the temple at the hour of prayer. Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked an alms. And Peter fastening his eyes upon him with John said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Yes, he did. <laughs> and then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. You see, I think somehow our worship gathering would be different if somebody came in here walking and leaping and praising God. <laughs> right? I think somehow the passion for worship would be different if just before you came here you found out that the, the doctor's prognosis of cancer over you had just been cured by Jesus. I think somehow if we had a revelation of the life that God has given to us, the, how the penalty of death that was over us has been removed through the blood of Jesus and we were reminded of that fresh before we came into here, our passion for worship would be different. Once again, our time is drifting away. I want us to go to Revelation chapter 12. The good news is God has plans for us. The good news is that there's anybody in this room that God has forgotten about or forsaken. You may be in a dire strait, but God wants to do something great. Are you ready to receive and receive from Him? Revelation chapter 12, starting at verse 9, it said, And the great, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And then what does verse 11 say? 
It says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Ah, the word of their testimony. That's why our mouth is important. It's the word of a testimony. It's of us coming into agreement with God for this world, for your neighbor, for your life, for your situation. We study the Bible, we meditate on His Word, that it might be in us, that our natural response that the world wants us to have, we don't have anymore. So when negative things come, instead we see what God wants to do. When we approach the blind man at the side of the road, or the, or the lame man at the side of the road, we're not looking to uh, enter into casual conversation with them, not that there's anything wrong with that. But our goal is that we might offer Him hope and life. That when the rich man goes by in his limousine, we aren't mad and angry at him, but that we might have an opportunity to invest in him hope and life. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. If we're serious about reaching the world, God says to us that we have to have a testimony, not 65-year-old testimony, a current testimony. The Bible says we have not because we ask not. So if nothing's happened in our life, whose fault is that? Find out what's going on. Get in God's presence. Seek His face. Come forward for prayer. Have somebody stand with you. But whatever it takes, get in God's presence and get a testimony. Amen. The testimony might be, you know what, this week God filled me with His peace because I, I prayed out to Him with all, all my issues and I know He hurt me and He's answering me. Your testimony might be, I got to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with someone next door. And I got to share it with all His love and compassion. Your testimony might be, you know what? Everybody else at my job was complaining about work, but I worked hard. I worked hard, and I just did my job because all I could see was Jesus smiling down at me. Your testimony might be that that thing that held me in bondage was broken off this week and I'm free. Your testimony might be that, you know what, after all these years of been just going through the motions of my life, God has spoken something real to me and I'm going out with passion to reach the world for the gospel. And that's my testimony I'm excited about and I want to tell you about. God wants to do something in all of us. That whenever we, that's why the word says that we should always be ready to give an answer of the hope that lies in us. If, if, if your fear today is that I might say to you, well, you give me an answer why the hope lies in you. Oh, don't look to me. I've got to hide behind the chair. You should be able to say, hey, let me tell you. Hey, let me tell you. Well, there's great things happening. We should have to go, whoa, whoa, whoa. We don't have room for time for all of you guys. Right? Because God wants to do stuff. God isn't dead. God is alive. The gospel of Jesus Christ is alive. Your neighbors need someone who believes in a God that's alive. The people at your job need someone who believes in a God that's alive. So that half of your job or at the end of your day when you're finishing, everybody's running to the parking lot to meet you saying, wait, wait, don't go. I need you to pray for this. I need you to pray for that. Right? Is that the way it should be? Yes. Because they know that your prayers get answered. And then you say to them, you know what? Not only do I want to pray with you, but I want to pray with you that your prayers could be answered. I want to pray with you that you might come to know the King of kings and Lord of lords. That you might be able to enter into His presence. I don't know where you are today. But I invite you, I'm just going to close with a prayer. And I invite you, if you're not sure where you stand with God, that today you would open up your heart and say, you know what, I believe what the Bible says. That Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world and I believe He meant me. And I received that price paid on the cross. That through the shed blood of Jesus, I might be able to come into the presence of the living God. That God might be real in me. I accept God's free gift of His salvation. Father God, we come before You, each and every one of us. And God, we all need more of You in our life. We all need more of You in our life. And so God, we ask for Your forgiveness for trying to live it on our own. We ask You to forgive us. That we have not used the tools and the vehicles and the prayer opportunities and the coming in before you the way you wanted us to. But instead we thought that in our own wisdom we can do it. 
And so God, we come before you and we say, God, show me. Show me how I can more walk with you. How I can have more of you in my life. How I can be more of a testimony for you. Whether it's at my job or standing in the grocery line or whatever. And God, I come before you and I say, God, I believe that Jesus died for me. And I thank you for it. And God, I believe that by believing in the shed blood of Jesus and His free gift of salvation, by accepting that, I have access to you. I am born again. I can walk in newness of life. And God, I just ask that you would fill me with your presence. That you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. That God, that I might be empowered and strengthened with might that comes from you. That God, that your joy might fill me. That the peace that passes all understanding might come into my life. And that I might live with a new purpose and a new passion. And that is to share with everyone about how I've been free. And how they too can be free. And so God, we commit our lives into your hands. And we ask your blessing upon us. And we ask that you would lead us forth into your work. That we might rejoice in the work you've called us to. That we might reap where others have sown. And we may sow where others will yet come to reap. In Jesus' name. Amen.